I receive research support from GE Healthcare. So today I'm going to present about uh, different cardiac CNE acquisition techniques and then how do we get the signal with RF spoiled GRE and what governs the, uh, the blood signal, myocardial signal with balanced SSFP imaging and then some of the challenges of balanced SSFP imaging at 3 Tesla and how can we reduce some artifacts that we see. So we acquire cardiac CNE images with either prospective ECG triggering or retrospective ECG gating. So in prospective ECG triggering, as soon as we detect the QRS complex, we acquire the first segment for all the cardiac phases. Know that as we saw earlier, the acquisition duration is defined and it's constant and it's defined to be lesser than the lowest RR interval. And once we see the next trigger pulse, we acquire the second segment and we fill the entire case space. So the reconstruction with this technique is very simple. All we have to do is combine these different seg segments to Fourier transform and we get the final cardiac CNE images. The most popular one that we do generally is retrospective ECG gating. So this is very similar to prospective ECG triggering. That is, we advance to different segments as soon as we see uh, the, uh, as soon as we detect the QRS complex, but then we acquire the data continuously. Know that even in normal subjects in a very short breath hold, our heart rate is not constant. Say, for example, we have a variable heart RR interval here from 7.5 cardiac phases in the first beat and 8.5 cardiac phases in the second beat. And so the reconstruction with this method is a little more involved because we have to consider this RR interval variations. So we have to normalize our RR interval, uh, RR interval differences. So we'll end up having this uh, space of normalized RR interval and KY where the data will be non-uniformly distributed. So, and then we could uniformly distribute by using any of the interpolation techniques. So as we can see here, the advantage of using retrospective gating is we can acquire even the late diastolic phases, which are not possible with prospective triggering. But as we saw earlier, prospective triggering works well in patients who have variable heart rates, like in patients with atrial fibrillation. So with this reconstruction technique in mind, how do we design a cardiac CINE sequence? So as we saw here, we combine data from different uh, uh, time points, acquired at different time points. So we need a steady state sequence to do cardiac CINE imaging. And we acquire images in very different imaging planes. And to do a cardiac function, we need a bright blood and a dark myocardial signal. And so we need a sequence that, is, that provides this good contrast and it should be independent of the imaging plane. And the third one is, as you can see here, there's flow, a blood flow that is happening. There's also myocardial motion. So we need a sequence that's not very susceptible to flow and motion. So essentially the zero and the first order gradient movements of our sequence should be close to zero. So the first sequence that I'll discuss about is RF spoil GRE. So here, apart from the RF uh, pulse, slice encoding and phase encoding and readout gradients, we have these extra gradients shown in red, uh, orange here. So these are gradient spoiler gradients. And then uh, we also introduce a quadratic R of spoiling here. So with both R of spoiling and gradient spoiling, we, get, we can get good T1 weighted images. But if you look at the M1 moments here, or the first order gradient moments, they are not close to zero at the time of echo. So we can flow compensate these sequence by adding these extra gradients shown in LO. So if we now uh, calculate the M1 gradient moments, they are close to zero at the time of echo. So this gives a very good uh, flow compensated sequence. So to explain this better, on the left are images acquired without flow compensation and on the right are images acquired with flow compensation in both short axis and long axis view. And you can clearly appreciate that the blood uh, inhomogeneities that we see without flow compensation is much com it's compensated well with um, flow compensation in both slice and read directions. Note that this is a problem only when we acquire images at long TE. So the second thing is, how do we get the contrast with R of spoil GRE? We know that the T1 of blood is longer than T1 of myocardium. So if we're doing a T1 weighted sequence, ideally the blood will be dark compared to the myocardium. 
Here are similar simulations of the steady state signal along y-axis and different flip angles. As you can see here with increasing flip angle, both the myocardial signal and the stationary blood signal in decreases. But now if we consider the flow component, you can see that the flow signal increases with increasing flip angle. And in general, we acquire our spoil GRE at a flip angle of about 15 degrees or so because we, want to, uh, we do not want to have more noise in the myocardium and we also want very good blood myocardial contrast. So here are more images to compare the effects of different flip angle. As you can see in the top row, with increasing flip angle, you can see that the blood signal increases. If you look at the four chamber view, however, the blood signal in the left ventricle is almost has a similar signal uh, level compared to the myocardium. So this is because in the long axis view, in the, especially in the left ventricle, you see predominantly in plane flow, which results in similar uh, blood signal and uh, similar signal in the blood and myocardium. And this is also true in patients who have poor cardiac function. So just to summarize, our spoil GRA gives us a T1 weighted uh, signal which results in similar blood and myocardial signal and the contrast that we see is only due to the bright blood and the optimal flip angle is around 15 degrees that we use. And, but the disadvantage is that this is very flow dependent and does not work in long axis uh, planes as well as in patients with poor cardiac function. So, and we also saw the need for doing flow compensation in images uh, in acquisitions with long TE. So the second sequence that we look at is balanced SSFP sequence. As we saw earlier, uh, all the gradients and all the axes are completely uh, compensated. That is, if we compute the area, zero order gradient movement here, they are all zero in all the three case, in all the three axes. So this is a flow compensated, very well flow compensated sequence. And even if you look at the M1 movements, they're very close to zero at the echo time. Note that the steady state signal of balanced SSFP is T2 by T1 weighted. So the, blood, uh, the signal computation in balanced SSFP in the presence of flow is a little more involved because of these complete refocusing of gradients. So since the gradients are completely refocused, even if after they exit the imaging slice, they still contribute to the signal. And so the signal that we see is actually the summation of the signal in both the excited slice and out of slice contributions as well. So here is the simulation. Again, in yellow is the spins that are within the excited slice, and in magenta are the spins that leave the excited slice. And you can see here, even after they leave the excited slice, they contribute to a lot of signal. But in, on, on average, the signal uh, out of slice contributions is close to zero. And on resonance, we see the contribution mainly due to the excited slice. So here is another simulation showing uh, along x-axis different flip angles and along y-axis it's a steady state signal. You can see that um, even in a stationary case there is very good blood myocardial signal and optimal flip angle is around 45 to 75 degree. But now if include the flow component to it, our optimal flip angle increases to about 75 to 120 degrees, as you can see here. Here are more examples. Again, in the top row, you can see that with increasing flip angle, there is uh, increasing blood signal and reduced myocardial signal. And this is uh, true in both short axis and long chamber view. And our optimal flip angle is close to 75 and 105 degrees. And this sequence works well even in patients with poor cardiac function as shown in the top row. So note that we can see very good signal differences between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So because here in the left ventricle, the signal is predominantly in plane flow and in the right ventricle, the, the, the signal is predominantly due to three, through plane flow. And you can see very good signal differences between these due to the flow effects of balanced SSFP. So, which of these is a balanced SSFP acquisition? Do you think it's one A, or is it B, or is it both A and B? Okay, raise, your, raise your hands. Do you think it's A? Do you think it's B? Okay, great. 
Thank you. So yeah, this is uh, the f uh, balanced SSFP. So here you can see bright fat signal here in balanced SSFP. Also, we see very good uh, dark signal and all the mus uh, muscles indicating that it's a balanced SSFP sequence. So, so far we were looking at all the benefits of balanced SSFP. So, but balanced SSFP sequence is very, very sensitive to inhomogeneities. So you can see that the signal is not constant with the varying frequency, and there are points of frequency where the signal drops to zero. And the distance between the signal voids is uh, proportion, inversely proportional to the repetition time. So here, in the, showing in the red arrows, you can see signal voids in the stationary tissue. But when there is a band within a flowing vessel, you can see that the signal becomes more complex. You can see that there's a very bright signal in the presence of a band uh, in a flowing vessel. Note that we do not see these artifacts in an RF spoil GRE because the gradient spoil intri introduces this uh, variation in the signal within each voxel and what we measure is actually the average signal in our spoil GRE so we do not see these panning artifacts in our spoil GRE. So what governs the signal of flowing vessel in the presence of a band? So here is a similar simulation that I showed earlier but in the presence of a a band of resonance band. Again, LO here represents the signal within the excited slice and magenta here represents the signal within the out of slice. As you can see in the bottom right, the out of slice contribution uh, sig uh, increases a lot. And note that the, uh, the excited slice contribution and out of slice contribution have very different scale. And the main signal that we see is due to these out of slice contributions. And you can see that the signal is very, very high, which is due to the, which is the uh, bright blood signal that we see in the presence of uh, bands. Here are more simulations here, results showing that the signal intensity depends on the flip angle and depends on the flow rate, and they result in a very bright signal in the presence of a band. What governs um, the balanced SSFB signal with changes in TR, TE, and bandwidth? So as we saw earlier, the, uh, the, si the distance between these signal voids is inversely proportional to TR. So as TR increases, these bands come near closer to one another. There are more mo uh, uh, images showing that with increasing TR, you can see the bands that is coming within the field of view of the three-chamber view of the heart. And this is also true if we increase the spatial resolution, our TR naturally increases, resulting in more artifacts. So just to summarize, balanced SSFP gives us a very good T2 by T1 weighting, which results in a dark myocardium and a bright blood signal. And this, uh, the balanced SSFP signal is also flow dependent, which gives us, which makes the optimal flip angle to be about close to 75 degrees. And we also saw about uh, the off resonance artifacts and the contribution of off resonance artifacts in the presence of flow. So this limits our TR, and we would require to acquire these images with minimum possible TR. Balanced SSFP imaging becomes more complicated at 3 Tesla because at a higher field strength our inhomogeneities increases as well. So here uh, here's an image acquired at zero, uh, 0 hertz. So if we could move these bands we can acquire different images to move the bands b uh, outside our region of interest. So here in this case they're shifting the frequency here which shifts our um, frequency response to, for example, the blue uh, curves indicate that the frequency response has shifted to the center of about minus 80 hertz here and LO is minus 160 hertz. So by shifting these curves we can get, uh, we can move these bands outside our region of interest. How do we shift these curves? By changing our RF phase increment. So here are again another image is showing that by shifting these um, frequency bands outside our uh, region of interest, we can get very good balanced SSFP images at 3 Tesla. So 
how can we reduce these image artifacts at 3 tesla? Uh, we assume that the scanner um, computes our TR to minimum TR and TE. So can we reduce these image artifacts by reducing spatial resolution, by adjusting the frequency to move the bands, by increasing receiver bandwidth, or by doing all of the above? So one, to reduce spatial resolution, uh, two, adjusting the frequency to move the bands. Uh, three, increasing f uh, receiver bandwidth. Four, all of the above. Right. So yeah, it's all of the above. So by reducing the spatial resolution, we are changing the gradient strength. So that will enable us to shorten the TR. And we, also, we already saw that by adjusting the frequency, we can move the bands at, uh, outside the field of view. And by increasing the re receiver bandwidth, we are um, shortening our um, readout gradients so we can, uh, uh, we can uh, shorten the TR subsequently as well. So there are also situations where um, we have to acquire with at a high resolution and our bands are within the region of interest and we are not able to move the bands by changing the frequency. So in this case, there is another technique called wide band SSFP. This is similar to balanced SSFP, but it, it uses an alternating TR, a shorter TR and a longer TR. And we acquire data only during the longer TR. So by using this alternating TR technique, <coughs> we can move, we can increase the null-to-null -null spacing of these um, frequency response curves. And this spacing between these null-to-null -null points is uh, proportional to this ratio of TRS and TR. And so here are more movies, again, showing that by using wideband SSFB, we can move these bands, um, we can increase these null-to-null -null spacing and move these bands outside our region of interest. Another way of reducing image artifacts at 3 tesla is also going towards contrast and Ansara spoil GRE. Several clinical exams these days are performed with contrast on board, like MRA delayed enhancement. So here's an uh, example comparing images acquired at 1.5 tesla with balanced SSFB. And in the middle, R of spoil GRE. You can again see that there's more inhomogeneities in the blood signal without contrast. And on the right is an intra intravascular agent showing a very good uniform bright blood signal. Uh, here are more movies uh, with, uh, in patients with uh, ICD. And on the left are pre-contrast images. You can see that there's more signal in homogeneities, which is reduced well by using post-contrast, uh, by acquiring these images in post-contrast. Um, here is a patient with dysplastic mitral valve, again acquired with two different contrast agents, again showing very good uniform blood signal and good blood myocardium contrast, and um, another intravascular agent showing very good blood myocardium contrast as well. So which of these is an R spoiler GI reacquisition? Um, is it A, or is it B, or is it C, or both B and C? So A, uh, B, C, both B and C. Great, yeah. Uh, it's both B and C. So the middle image here has more inhomogeneities in the blood, which is due to the R of spoil GRE, which can be corrected by using uh, an intravascular agent in this case. So just to summarize, with balanced SSFP, we get very good uh, T2 by T1 weighting signal. And with pre-contrast R of spoil GRE, we get a T1 signal. So the bright blood signal and balanced SSFP is mainly due to T2 by T1 as well as due to flow. Whereas R of spoil GRE is only due to flow. So the disadvantage of using R of spoil GRE is that it gives very poor contrast in long axis view and also in patients with poor cardiac function. So the optimal flip angle for balanced SSFB in general is high, and for our spoil GRE is about 15 to 20 degrees. So because of this flip angle, um, the SAR for balanced SSFB is very, very high. In general, our flip angle is governed by the SAR for balanced SSFB acquisitions. We saw that balanced SSFB is very sensitive to B0 and homogeneities, which results in the banning artifacts, which requires us to acquire these images with minimum TR and TE. 
and we also saw the importance of doing flow compensation and case of GRE uh, when we acquire images with long T. By acquiring these images with our spoil GRE at prose contrast, we, we have this extra T1 weighting which enables us to acquire images in all the imaging planes. So the optimal flip angle for this is variable. It depends on the time after our injection, depends on the contrast agent, and several different factors. So in general, it's higher than pre-contrast our spoil GRE. And again, uh, it has properties very similar to our spoil GRE. That I'd like to thank uh, everyone who contributed to the slides and thank you very much.